Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Can you hear my voice? Hopefully it's clear. Yes. Uh, so on behalf of Saudi Society of Blood Disorder, I would like to welcome our speakers today and all the attendees in this hematology webinar series. Uh, I'm Dr. Nahla Al-Sham, consultant hematopathologist, and I'm glad to chair today live webinar. Uh, to discuss uh, the hemostasis and anticoagulant monitoring with two outstanding speakers. We have today Dr. Steve Kitchen and Dr. Tariq Aweda. Uh, today we will have three talks. The first will be by Dr. Uh, Steve Kitchen. He will present a pre-analytical variable in hemostasis uh, testing in 25 minutes. Then Dr. Uh, Dr. Tariq Aweda will talk about the hemostasis and anticoagulant monitoring clinical perspective in 25 minutes. Then Dr. Steve will talk again about diagnostic solution for anticoagulant monitoring. Um, after that, we'll have 15 minutes for question and answer. And I would remind all the uh, audience to put their questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat, please. To start with Dr. Stephen King, I'll be glad to present him. Uh, he's our first speaker. Uh, Dr. Steve is a lead clinical scientist in the Department of Coagulation, Sheffield Hemophilia and Thrombos Thrombosis Centers. Uh, this center is designed as International Hemophilia Training Center by World Federation of Hemophilia. He is also a scientific director, UK National External Quality Assessment Scheme and WHO International uh, external quality assessment scheme for blood coagulation since 2001. Dr. Steve is a director of um, World Federation Hemophilia International External Quality Assessment uh, Scheme for Blood Coagulation since 2012. Uh, he is known for his several hundred or representation and more than 300 abstract uh, including most of the recent International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis and Scientific Standardizations Committee and World Federation of Hemophilia and other congresses in over 50, 50 uh, countries over 30 years of work. Uh, Dr. Steve, the floor is uh, for you to present your uh, talk. Um, and uh, please, audience, remember to put your questions for Dr. Steve in the Q&A box. Go ahead, Dr. Steve. Well, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Nella, for that, that very kind introduction. Um, and uh, I, it's a great pleasure for me to take part in this uh, webinar. I think it's um, fantastic that th these webinars are being put on by the Saudi Society. And, and it's a pleasure for me to participate. Um, it's also particularly a pleasure to uh, sh share the program with Dr. Rikawaida, since we worked together, we just refreshed our memory that we worked together for the first time, probably 16 years ago. And we, I think remained, I hope remained firm friends ever since. So in the first um, session, I think my brief was to discuss uh, pre-analytical variables in hemostasis. So I'll try to do that over the next 25 minutes or so. So I think it's a real big issue for us, in particularly in hemostasis, the problems of having to reject samples which are not fit for analysis. So how, how big is that problem? So I'm going to show you some data from a local audit uh, looking at all causes of sample rejection in my coagulation laboratories in Sheffield. So we've got two labs and we receive over the uh, three month period that I'm going to discuss, we would normally receive around 60,000 blue top citrate tubes for coagulation tests. And in this particular audit period in 2018, during a three month period, just over 2,500 samples were rejected because they did not meet the acceptance criteria. They were not properly filled, they were hemolyzed, not properly labeled and so on. And so over a 12 month period, extrapolating that data, that would be around 10,000 samples. So if you think about Sheffield, uh, we're serving a population of about 600,000. So that's more or less 1% of the United Kingdom. So, so if all of the other labs in the UK, if they all uh, had a similar rejection rate, that, that would be more or less 1 million citrate tubes rejected every year in the UK. So, so this is a substantial problem. And of course, each sample that's rejected can 
uh, lead to some delays in availability of results, let's say. There is, however, quite a variable practice amongst UK laboratories and international surveys that have addressed this same question have also reported uh, substantial variability in practice between different centres. So these are some survey data from our national external quality assessment scheme, our proficiency testing programme, and, and this is for blood coagulation. So in this particular survey, 270 centres responded, and I apologise, the slide shows the proportion of citrate tubes rejected for different reasons. And you can see that it's quite variable from somewhere between zero and 5% of all samples for clotting tests rejected because of hemolysis. And I think if you, if you, if you think about icterus, bilirubin, of course, this is something which is present in the patient. It's not an artifact in the way that hemolysis is frequently an in vitro artifact. That's not the case for icterus. It's not the case for lipemia. In, in the case of lipids and bilirubin, these are present not only in the sample, but in addition, also in the patient. So it's not possible to obtain a blood sample from those patients that does not contain that substance. So for me, it would be better to accept and test those samples in which bilirubin or lipemia is present. So I think there's variable practice and in some cases, inappropriate practice. If we look in more detail, it's again a data from my own centre over a five or six, seven year period. If we look in more detail, what, what are the most common causes of sample rejection? And, and the reason why I've covered the period in, on this slide between 2011 and 2016, is this is the period in which we introduced for the first time in my centre automated assessments of tube filling, underfilling, and also automated assessments of hemolysis. So if we look at the hemolysis column first, you can see an, an increase in the proportion of samples being rejected as a consequence of in vitro hemolysis from 0.4% up to 2% at the end of this period. And, and we also saw an increase in the rejection rate for tubes which were underfilled from 0.6 up to around 1.9%. So, so when this uh, increase occurs, I think there's two possibilities. One is that there really was a genuine change and increase in the number of samples which suffered from these problems, hemolysis underfilling. But the second, and I think the much more likely explanation for our increased rejection, the second possibility is that we got better at detecting the presence of these problems. And, and I think that indeed is the, is the real explanation because we introduced automated checks for hemolysis around about this time here. And you can see that the increase coincides with better assessment, better detection. And the same for underfilling, we introduced here uh, an automated uh, method of detecting underfilling on, on the particular analyzers in use at the time, Sysmex CS5100s, which has an automated check for hemolysis, for icterus, for lipemia, HIL check. So, so I think it tells me that before those introductions of automated checks, we were failing to detect some of these important pre-analytical problems. And I think we should also remind ourselves that when we make a rejection of a sample, it's not always replaced. And, and this slide shows some uh, audits over three month periods over several years. The total proportion of rejected samples rose from 3% to around 5%. And we asked the question, we, we interrogated our IT system, our laboratory information system, and we asked the question, after a sample is rejected, is it replaced in the next 24 hours? Has it been replaced within the following week? And these are the proportion of samples which were not replaced. So about half of samples in my own center did not get a replacement within the following 24 hours. And even after one week, about a third of samples had not been replaced. So of course, some of those may, may well be tests which were not required. I think we all know that not every lab test is in the end, uh, let's say appropriately requested. But on the other hand, I'm really quite confident that a very significant proportion of those <coughs> missing samples were important tests. Those tests were not available and that will cause delays and problems in patient management. So I think we should always keep this in mind when making decisions about which samples to reject. So a few comments on different aspects of analytics in relation to hemostasis. 
once a blood sample is collected, it's important that whilst it's whole blood and indeed after centrifugation, we, we should not store this in the fridge between two to eight degrees. This is a, uh, a study which uh, indicated that it, for samples stored in the fridge, even three and a half hours stored at four degrees, there was a loss of factor eight and von Willebrand factor protein, both as antigen or in this case as collagen binding activity loss of factor eight, loss of VWF, with significantly lower results if the sample was stored at four degrees. The impact was sufficient so that approximately half of these, more or less 40 normal subjects, half of these had results consistent with von Willebrand's disease, misclassified as von Willebrand's disease. So I think it's important not to store samples in this way. We know that there are different strengths of citrate anticoagulant available and commercially available. In particular, most uh, tubes contain around 0.129 molar um, or, uh, or a lower strength anticoagulant around 0.109 molar. Apologies. And what we noticed, and the, what the literature tells us, is that if an ISI, International Sensitivity Index, if it's assigned with samples collected into the higher strength, and then we use that ISI, to determine INRs in our patient samples, when the samples are then collected in the lower strength, all our INRs would be too low. I think what, what certainly could happen in, in the middle bullet point, the commercial companies make their value assignments for ISI using blood samples collected into this lower strength, and that's, that's recommended by the World Health Organization. So that's common practice. It means if in our laboratories, and our hospitals, if we collect the samples into the higher strength, all of our INRs will be too high because the ISI is inaccurate and the, the impact is up to around 20%, at least when an INR is just above, let's say, the therapeutic range. So these are important differences. So I think we don't want to do what this, this situation here. We shouldn't be collecting samples into the higher strength and, and using these for INR determinations. What about the question of the ratio of blood to anticoagulant in the tube. So these are two tubes collected from the same patient. And on the right, the, the two tubes have got the same uh, volume of citrate anticoagulant and are designed to be filled to, to this approximate level. So the tube on the left, excuse me, is clearly underfilled. It does not contain sufficient blood. It still has the same volume of citrate anticoagulant. So is it safe to test the sample on the left? Well, it's not safe to test. These are the results on those two samples, the properly filled, the correct ratio of blood to anticoagulant, the truth, the INR should have been 3.7, the APTT 45 seconds. If we had accepted and tested this underfilled sample, if that had been tested, we would have obtained these results on the right, a falsely elevated INR, a falsely elevated APTT a difference by enough to impact on the patient management. So it's important that we do not accept such tubes. And, and we've got a number of studies which have looked at the extent of underfilling of blood collection tubes. And these are some data from my own centre in relation to APTTs. These are five tubes collected from the same healthy normal subjects. We, we repeated this in 20 different healthy normal subjects. And we measured APTT on the five tubes. So 100% filled, the correct ratio, blood to anticoagulant, the truth. We should be obtaining this result around 28, 29 seconds. Excuse me, 90% of target, an accurate result. But when we get down to 75 and below, we, we see a false prolongation. So based on these data in my own center, we accept and test tubes provided the filling is at least 80% of its target volume. For some publications which suggest 90 percent but, but in our experience and certainly for the reagents that we've been using i'm quite content to accept 80 percent or above of course there is another situation in which the ratio of uh, plasma to citrate is disturbed because in the end it's not the ratio of blood to citrate which is important it's the ratio of plasma to citrate because of course the citrate is removing the calcium from the plasma so the other situation in which we see an altered plasma to citrate ratio is when the patient has an elevated hematocrit. 
And so this slide shows a number of uh, real patient samples, real patients from my own centre. The hematocrits are shown on the left. Um, so hematocrits between 65% and 71%, 0.65, 0.71. These are patients with uh, congenital heart defects in which there is a, a, a higher level of red cells in, in response to the poor uh, oxygenation that's a consequence of the heart defect. And, and these patients in this particular slide have increased thrombotic risk. So the patients are taking vitamin K antagonists, in this case, warfarin. So if we had, uh, let's say, used this conventional nine parts of blood to one part citrate that would normally be appropriate, this in the column is the INRs we would have obtained. However, we, in taking account of the hematocrit, we made an adjustment to the ratio of blood to anticoagulant to take account of this elevated hematocrit. And when we do that, then we obtain an accurate INR, and that's shown here. So I think you can see that in some cases, these are, these are really quite important uh, differences between the truth and these false elevations as a consequence of citrate excess. So we've got uh, options to deal with this. There aren't many patients that require this. Um, we have about 10 or 15 amongst, uh, gosh, about 4,000 patients are taking warfarin at the moment. So we've got uh, a reference here that gives an indication of how to make this adjustment. So if we could just turn our attention now to hemolysis. So I've shown on this slide some artificial in vitro hemolysis. And these uh, units are in grams per litre. So this would be a sample, the first one with, let's say, a, a hemoglobin measurement from that patient might be 150. So with 15 grams per litre plasma hemoglobin, that's about 10% of the cells lies. Really, really quite red. And these kinds of levels, I think, are typically seen in, in patient samples, at least arriving in my own center. So just keep those uh, colors in mind a little bit as we look at some of the data. There are a number of ways in which uh, hemolysis can be induced in vitro. One of those can be, let's say, excessive vibration of the sample if it's being transported through a pneumatic tube system and in which that pneumatic tube system has not been um, prepared in such a way that the sample is protected from vibration. Excuse me. So, of course, there's normally a pod system that passes through the, the tubes. And if we put a sample in there but don't properly protect it from vibration and movement with packaging, then we could lead to hemolysis. And these four uh, samples here are, are plasmas prepared, four samples from the same normal subject. And, and, and the first one and the, and the third and fourth are samples which have either been transported by hand, transported a short distance through the pneumatic tube, or transported a long distance with appropriate packaging to protect them from vibration. And the, the pink one, this is a sample not properly protected, the sample is moving around in the uh, pod carrier, and, and this leads to excessive vibration and rupture of the cells. And there are now um, mimic tubes, uh, artificial tubes shown on the left, that can actually monitor that vibration and movement and, and give a, a, let's say, a, a, a measurement of the degree of uh, vibration and, and shock that the sample has been exposed to. And of course, that gives us the chance to monitor it, make changes, improve and, and let's say improve the quality um, by perhaps changing the packaging and so on. Um, so I put on there, the, uh, the this is a company in Canada that we worked with to, to look at this, this kind of impact, let's say, and I've got a manuscript just coming out on this at the moment. We should just remind ourselves that, of course, a, a very small proportion, perhaps one or two percent of samples in which hemolysis is visible, about one or two percent of those the hemolysis is not only in the sample, it is also in addition in the patient. It's real, it's not artifact. This slide shows an example of a sickle cell patient in, in sickle crisis, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, uh, a number of TTP. You could think of a number of situations in which the hemolysis is real, it's in the patient, and therefore automatically will always be in that sample. And those samples, I think, we have to accept and test. It's only where, I believe we, where we believe the hemolysis is artificial, it's an artifact. Those are the samples that I think should be considered for rejection. And, and so, of course, if we are rejecting, then it's 
uh, often the case that we will receive a replacement. So I'm going to show you a few slides with some data uh, in which we compared results on a reject hemolyzed sample and on a clear sample without hemolysis from the same patient which was sent in to replace the reject. So the clear sample is, is let's say the truth, any results we obtain on the reject hemolyzed sample, that that's a difference is, is likely in most cases to relate to the cause and consequence of hemolysis. So these are the differences of Van Dalton and Potts in the next few slides. The difference in this case in prothrombi time between a reject hemolyzed sample and a replacement that was clear. Now what you can see I think on this slide is that the majority of these differences between the pairs of samples are less than one second and this is the average PT here. So these are very small differences. It's an indication that hemolysis has a minimal impact on PT. And in fact, once we had obtained this data set, we adjusted our practice in my center and we no longer reject samples for prothrombin time based on these data, because we can see that the differences are really quite small. And that's the same also in relation to INR, a similar style here. This is the, each, each point is the difference between INR on a hemolyzed sample and the INR on a clear replacement. And the samples with the highest levels of hemoglobin, the most serious in vitro hemolysis, uh, shown in, in, in yellow. And even for these, the differences between the INRs on the two samples are, are, are not so great, around about 0.3 here, when the INR is at four. So that might be four versus 3.7. It might be 4.1 versus 3.8. I don't think that's sufficient to make a difference in the adjust in the management of that patient. So for the same reason, in my own center, we took the decision that actually hemolyzed samples can be accepted and tested safely for INR determinations. However, I don't think that's the case. I'm really quite confident that's not the case in relation to APTTs. So again, a similar um, plot. This is a, a series of APTTs performed with Actin FS on a CS5100 analyzer. And these again are the difference in APTT between the two samples. Hemolyzed reject, clear replacement. 12 seconds difference. 11 seconds difference. Five, six seconds, five seconds, five seconds. So differences in both directions. It's not the case that we only see a change in one direction. Sometimes the hemolysis causes a false prolongation. Sometimes it causes a false shortening of APTT. It's unpredictable. And since it's unpredictable, and because some of these differences are seen five seconds and more, it means that we are seeing false normal results and false abnormal results. So in my opinion, it would be necessary to reject hemolyzed samples for APTT. Does that effect depend on the level of hemolysis? I don't think it does. I apologize, because this is now the level of hemoglobin in the reject sample. So the free plasma hemoglobin. And now what we're seeing on this slide is that the degree of impact, 10 seconds longer, 15 seconds longer, 11 seconds here, different. It's some of the samples with really quite low hemoglobins, barely pink, where we've seen big differences. And yet when we've got this much, much bigger levels of hemolysis on the right, we're not seeing very big effects. So there's no relationship. So I think anything where hemolysis is present should not be accepted and tested for APTT if we believe that hemolysis is only in the sample. This is a photo-optical system. And of course, one of the most obvious differences between a hemolyzed and non-hemolyzed sample is the red color. On the other hand, it's now been reported that these same problems occur if we use mechanical endpoint detection. These are some data on a Stego analyzer, a different APTT reagent, once again, pairs of samples. And, and, and the, the blue point is the, the non hemolyzed the clear sample, the truth, and the red is the hemolyzed sample from the same patient. And you can see change in both directions. Here the, here the uh, change is a, is a false elevation by hemolysis. Here is a false normal and another false normal. The solid line is the upper limit of the APTT reference range. So even here with, an op with a mechanical system, the problem still occurs. 
And I think that's not a surprise when we think carefully about what's happening in hemolyzed samples. It's not simply the red color. We've got rupture of red cells and membranes, rupture and activation of platelets, activating clotting, causing clots to form, active enzymes, consumption of factors. So I think we must reject, and, and it's not the case that a mechanical system is protected from this problem. In relation to D-dimer, these are again samples which were hemolyzed artificially, and, and this is a clear replacement. So, so these uh, on the clear replacement is the truth, and we can see a series of samples here, and these are four examples uh, from a group of around 40, 45, so about 10, 15 percent of this group. A false elevation, the truth should have been below the cutoff. The results we obtained on the hemolyzed elevated above the cutoff. So, so this could have been patients sent for ultrasounds that were, were not needed, let's say. We've got some recent uh, recommendations from uh, the World Federation of Haemophilia uh, in relation to a number of aspects of laboratory diagnosis, um, and that includes uh, aspects of sample collection and processing. I just wanted to make one point here underlined, and this is a, a reference that, of course, you can it's, on, it's published online now, it's possible to download, it's, it's uh, free and open access. But I just wanted to mention that I think we should, when it comes to secondary samples, samples uh, separated and sent off perhaps to a, a central laboratory, I think we should avoid storage of, pool, of pooled uh, patient plasma, uh, I apologise, well, platelet poor plasma, storage of platelet poor plasma, I think we should avoid storing these samples at minus 20, because this can be inadequate if, if we can see changes in the sample. If we've got minus 30, minus 40, minus 60, minus 70, this, this is much better. We've got uh, some more guidance coming through from the International Council for Standardization in Hematology, and, and this is um, uh, some of the recommendations that will be made in relation to secondary aliquots, recognizing that it's increasingly the case that samples are being sent uh, from, let's say, primary collection sites in, into uh, more and more centralized analysis. So these are some of the recommendations. We have to use the correct tubes. Uh, we recognize that the time taken to freeze the sample is important. It's why it's better to use something at minus 70 where possible. It will freeze the sample quickly. If we have to go for a lower temperature, then we should avoid minus 20, but minus 24, for example, we've got stability uh, from the published literature up to around three months. When those samples are being transported, we don't want partial thawing. It's important that they're maintained at a sufficiently low temperature. And, and so the recommendation is to use something like solid carbon dioxide. Thawing should be controlled at 37. And, and actually, this, excuse me, there are increasingly uh, data to indicate that if we go for a rapid freeze and a, and a, and a controlled thaw, we, we actually have got the possibility to look to, to use samples which have gone through two freeze thaw cycles, which, which is not something that we've uh, traditionally, uh, let's say, uh, it's something that's been traditionally avoided in hemostasis labs. But actually, the evidence suggests that it's not a problem if if we stick to this, freeze it quickly and, and also thaw it quickly. And then, finally, last slide. I think we should not forget that it's not only the, mm, the, the problem for the lab when it comes to rejecting and testing and, and all of the pre-analytical issues that we've discussed. These are patients, of course, and we should absolutely recognize that there is a cost associated with pre-analytical errors. This is a, a more or less a, a commercial study, let's say, that tried to put a figure on what happens when a, there's an important pre-analytical error what is the cost of that? And of course, it depends uh, very much on how that cost is calculated. But, but I think it's intuitive that there would be a cost. Um, and in this particular article, that they, they were able to put figures on the delays in getting results, the extended length of stay. Uh, and they came up with figures pretty similar in North America and in Europe of around $200 US dollars, for the average cost of an important pre error. So I think it's not good for patients. I think the quality of our results is absolutely dependent on the quality of our sample and their important cost implications. So thank you for your attention and I'm going to stop share and hopefully hand back to Dr. Miller. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Very interesting discussion about the pre-analytical
uh, issues with the handling of uh, uh, samples for INR. Uh, I'll move to Dr. Tariq Aweda now. He will uh, present uh, about the hemiostasis and uh, sorry about hemiostasis and anticoagulant monitoring clinical perspective. Dr. Tariq is a well-known active uh, consultant, hematologist, and hematopathologist in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center, Riyadh. Dr. Tariq's major uh, professional work was focused on thrombosis and hemostasis and transfusion medicines. He is um, very uh, active in the diagnosis and management of various thrombotic and bleeding disorders. Um, a lot of education, a lot of um, uh, active uh, uh, research work uh, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, interest. Uh, Dr. Tarek, uh, the floor is for you for your uh, talk. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you today and uh, to discuss an important subject. Frankly, over my career, I had noticed a lot of development uh, in, in this field, particularly in the management and the diagnosis and the monitoring of, of um, the anticoagulation and hemophilia drugs. I'll, I'll be focusing more because of the time on the anticoagulation, but at the end, maybe in five minutes, I will just highlight some points about the hemophilia drugs and the advancement in, in that field. Um, back to 2004, when um, Steve visited us, uh, on that time, uh, we had a couple of, of drugs. We had only few drugs known to be used for, for uh, management of venous thromboembolism. The unfractionated heparin, the low molecular weight heparin, and the warfarin. So these are the three drugs where we've been using it since 80s, and we were very fam familiar with their uh, management, their side effects, their uh, interactions, and uh, uh, the, the monitoring ways. As we... Uh, get more in time. In 2014, uh, the British Journal of Hematology had uh, issued a nice uh, uh, paper review about the movement in the anticoagulation. As, as you can see now, the list of anticoagulation from three major drugs, it expanded to more drugs, oral drugs, uh, 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 Dibigitran or Duax came to the seeing uh, the the uh, the other uh, 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 molecular weights like fundibur uh, uh, other bentosaccharides like fundibirinox, uh, more molecular weights uh, and more uh, uh, um, intravenous drugs came to the seeing, and that bring with it a, a, a challenge to to whom it it should be given and how we monitor uh, these drugs. Uh, the, 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 the list continue to grow up and, and uh, now we, we, we know that we have a bunch of, of drugs. Some of them or many of them had been approved for the management of uh, venous thromboembolism. Uh, uh, most of these drugs are targeted, either targeted to anti A or targeted to anti-2 or anti-thrombine. Anti so uh, these number of tests requires more knowledge about their actions, their uh, pitfalls, their uh, um, 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 risk of, of associated with, with the use of this, and adding to that, how to monitor them. Do we no, need to monitor them? Uh, I brought this slide. This is an old slide with the introduction of, of the wax. There was a look for an ideal anticoagulant. And part of that ideal anticoagulant has no routine monitoring. And everybody was seeking to have, if there is any anticoagulant that has no routine monitoring. And luckily, now we know that most of the uh, new drugs that we use uh, uh, either as, as uh, upfront in the management of uh, uh, the, the PTE or as a prophylaxis, we don't need um, to monitor these drugs. And most of them, they can be given either as a single uh, approach, as uh, it's seen in, in the, in the rifaroxaban and Stein uh, or uh, abixaban, or uh, with bridging with, with a low molecular weight as in the bigotran. Uh, uh, 
all these drugs had proven to be effective in, in, in controlling the thrombosis and preventing secondary uh, uh, thrombosis. Yet, there is a need to monitor these anticoagulation. As we learn more about these drugs, we know that there are situations where we need to monitor uh, these drugs and adjust the drugs based on the uh, uh, clinical situation. And this is what I will focus now to go through the clinical uh, uh, scenarios and uh, clinical uh, indications that possibly can be used for monitoring uh, and different anticoagulants. For, for, for unfractionated uh, heparin, we all know that it's, it's uh, uh, monitored by PTT ratio, PTT or PTT ratio, or antitin A when there is a, a problem to use the PTT. That particularly being seen with very high doses of um, um, uh, unfractionated heparin, more than 50 units uh, as we see in the cardiac surgeries, or uh, if there are things preventing the, the use of PTT, uh, the best example is presence of lupus anticoagulants where baseline PTT is high. So PTT becomes almost useless uh, in these patients. So you need to have an alternative. And uh, luckily we have the uh, calibrated antitin A that can be used to monitor the patients and adjust the dose based on the level of the antitin A. Patients on warfarin, as, as uh, uh, Steve had mentioned, we use INR, adjusted INR. All the problems of INR that had been, been uh, uh, explored by, by Stephen, uh, um, we still have many patients. We know that patients with cardiac pulse, a metallic cardiac pulse, they cannot use DUAC, so they continue to be on warfarin. We know that patients with treble positive antiphospholipid antibodies, again, uh, need to be on warfarin because do acts, they don't work. So warfarin will continue. How to measure warfarin? Do we measure it in the hospital? Measure it at home using a home devices, using a point of care? This is a big uh, uh, area. And uh, maybe if uh, um, Steve has some, some time in his next talk, I can explore uh, about or talk about uh, the different uh, uh, testing methodology that can be used for INR. Patient on low molecular weight. Not all times we need to, to monitor them. Only special situation when the patient needs to be monitored on antitin A. And remember, antitin A for low molecular weight is different from antitin A for unfractionated heparin. So uh, for those who are working in the lab, they have to uh, keep in mind. And again, this is one of the technical area I will leave it to, uh, to uh, Steve, but it's quite important because a mistake in ordering um, uh, a, a tin antitin A for um, uh, unfractionated instead of low molecular weight may result in, in a wrong result, which may which will affect the decision for for uh, dosing of those patients. There are situations where we need to monitor low molecular weight in high dose, in high weight, in high, in low weight uh, patients with renal and during pregnancies, and there are a couple of, of situations where you need to use the antitin A for monitoring uh, low molecular weight. Uh, Fondaparinox is, uh, I like that drug uh, of PO. It's not widely used, but it's a good drug, and uh, one of the, the advantage of Fondaparinox, it can be used in patients with HET if you don't have Argotroban or Herodines, and, and it, it's a nicely uh, uh, um, uh, recommended uh, in the, in the uh, 2012 and in the uh, 2016 ACCB uh, guidelines, you can use the fondoporinox. There are no reported cases of association of HET with fondoporinox, but uh, it, it's not the first line, but can be used in absence of, of um, argotroban or herodines. And again, in, in, in special situation, you need to monitor antitin A or monitor the fendoporinox using antitin A. Now it comes to the new category of drugs, duax, nuax, or whatever you call them. They are the new direct oral anticoagulants that uh, uh, get a lot of, of space and uh, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia, we have almost 50% or more than 50% of our new patients are on DUAX. In Germany, uh, almost 90% of, of the patients are on DUAX. 
there is a big move to, to uh, move most patients, except those with um, contraindication or uh, ineffectiveness of DUAX to be on warfarin. Now, DUAX, do we need to monitor them? and how we monitor them. And this is the, the next part of the, uh, of the talk that we will focus on to explore the, the clinical uh, uh, indication. And then I'll leave the technical part uh, for Steve to highlight on. But few points I, I, I need to highlight here from, again, from technical point of view. Patients on, on, on two anticoagulants like bridging uh, uh, warfarin, uh, and uh, anti uh, um, um, and low molecular weight heparin. You need to be sure that when you uh, when the patient is on an anticoagulant, the effect of that an antico uh, that anticoagulant doesn't affect the test of the other anticoagulant, and that's particularly can be seen only with the PTT. Sometimes the the patients, uh, if you start an patient on unfractionated heparin and you start warfarin, that's may affect the BTT, so that can affect the decision in stopping the, the antitin A before, before ending the, uh, or reaching the therapeutic level. The exact timing of sampling should be known, and, and that's clinical part for people who are uh, requesting or ordering the uh, test, you need to mention where is the, when the patient had taken the exact timing of the dosing, because that affect the, the measurements. And particularly for low molecular weight heparin, you need to have it within the four hours. And the same for the DUAX, you have to uh, respect the peak and trough of the DUAX as we will talk later about it. And it's quite important before moving from this slide is to highlight that you need always to correlate laboratory finding with the clinical outcomes. And if there is uh, uh, inconsistency between the two, you need to discuss it with your colleague in the lab and, and come up with solution for the, that discrepancy. Let's move to the DUACs, uh, the, the, the subject that gained a lot of concerns in the last uh, few years. We started DUACs uh, here in Saudi Arabia in 2010. Uh, 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 and uh, over 10 years, we had uh, seen a lot of things with DUAX. Uh, personally, uh, my first patient was in 2010, and uh, I, I remember how much it was difficult to, uh, to understand everything. Now we are more relaxed with DUAX. We know a lot. Still, there are areas where mm, are not uh, uh, quite sure about it, but many areas had been explored in, in, in management of, of VTE using DUAX. Uh, do we need to uh, uh, measure DUAX? That's an area uh, my friend Armand de Traburdi had explored quite nicely in many publications. And um, I'm getting some of his publication here, uh, which was again had been uh, cited in, in other uh, societies' uh, guidelines, uh, like the British Society guidelines. Uh, and basically, you can consider the, the measurements of the WAC before initiating of the treatment if you think that the patient has a risk of bleeding before surgery or in phase of, uh, procedures to know if the patient had cleared uh, uh, the, the amount of, of anticoagulant or the effect of anticoagulant, so no surprises during the surgery. Uh, during adverse events, if the patient on DUAC presented with a significant bleeding, talking about bleeding, it's not like uh, um, um, gum bleeds or uh, uh, um, drops of epistaxis. No, it's a major bleeding, a bleeding that uh, uh, comes obvious either you cannot stop it or uh, it, it, it's internal bleeding. Uh, that bleeding is significant, so you need to um, uh, look for the level of the anticoagulant and see if that patient is one of those unlucky to have an overreaction to the DUAX. If the patient presented with thrombosis, particularly if he's on long term of, of with, with DUAX and present with a new thrombosis. And keep in mind when the patient present with thrombosis to look at one of the uh, tests that we don't use for monitoring, but we use to see if the patient compliant or not. PT INR for, for rifurexaban uh, and BTT for the depigatran, they get rise a little bit 
uh, not in almost all patients, but in significant number of patients. So you can look at the INR and see if the patient is taking uh, the, the, uh, the, the drug or there is a compliance issue. But definitely with thrombosis, you need to measure the level of the anticoagulant in the uh, uh, blood of that patient. Uh, if, you, if you are deciding for thrombolytic therapy in a stroke patient, for example, uh, uh, you need to measure because that may increase the risk uh, uh, of bleeding. Although uh, uh, the, the uh, guidelines in general uh, re recommend not to start two acts if you think that you will use uh, thrombolytic in BE, like massive BE or stroke, and defer it until you finish from that decision. But if you make a decision later, and you need to know if the patient has a lot of, of anticoagulants effect so you can do the uh, measure the leveling. Before antidote, and I'll take, talk a little bit about the antidote because we were waiting for a long time to hear about the antidotes. Uh, and now it is available, but it's quite expensive and, and it's really expensive. So, and it's not available everywhere. That's another, another problem. Even uh, if it's uh, available, it's expensive. Uh, uh, before and after initiating of additional drugs that you may think that it may interact. And finally, if you have extreme weights, either high or low. Uh, and sometimes if you have a chronic uh, anticoagulation and the patient is presenting with some old presentation, you may need to go and, and look. This had been uh, accommodated and accepted uh, by the British uh, guidelines and 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 uh, published in 2014 by the British Journal of Hematology and almost the same what uh, uh, um, 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 uh, Trabudi had um, 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 recommended. It's been 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 uh, uh, adopted and uh, been uh, advised. There is only one thing added here, which is you can see that for elderly patient, the truffles may be useful to assess potential accumulation. And from my personal experience, this is quite true, especially for patients above 70 years. And in, in many situations, we found that patients above 70 uh, years may accumulate drug, and that could be uh, a cause for a presentation of uh, a, a mild to moderate uh, bleeding. Uh, uh, Trabudi had recommended to do the um, the level before and after, and this is uh, quoted from the uh, um, publication in the New England Journal, which for which the Hydra Suzumab had gained its uh, uh, approval, FDA approval for Dabigatran. Uh, and as you can see, that even with the uh, the drug that can be administered to uh, neutralize, there is a rebound phenomena of of uh, um, um, uh, effect and that may require the uh, use of another dose of antidote. So measurements of the effectiveness or residual anticoagulant effect uh, uh, will be helpful in that situation. How anticoagulation tests are affected by DUACs? There is a lot of, of talks about that. I, I think that, again, I will leave it more with, with, uh, for Steve. But as you can see, there is variable uh, uh, effect of, of various uh, um, drugs to the uh, known um, uh, tests, BT, BTT, uh, thrombine time, and antitin A activity. And, and that can be uh, 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 different, depends on the sensitivity of their agents, uh, sensitivity of the test, uh, reproducibility of the test, uh, all these, and linearity uh, of the response, all these can be uh, uh, an, an area of more and more uh, depth of, of uh, 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 discussion. One of the things that, again, I would like to highlight here is that Antitin A is not the same antitin A. And for those who are not working in the, in the laboratory, uh, you need to know that uh, 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 antitin A for unfractionated or low molecular and sometimes hybrid uh, calibration uh, is, are completely different from those with rifuroxaban, fondabernox, or uh, abitiban because there are different calibrators that uh, need to be used to draw the, the curve for, for measurements of of the drug level. 
Now, after, after doing the measurements, now what, what we expect, again, Armando had, had published this uh, 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 technical EMA, technical uh, annex, which uh, showed different uh, figures that we may uh, find, and that doesn't uh, 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 um, um, completely cover the, 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 uh, the DUAX level, but it, tis, it, 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 it gives us a range where we expect the expected level to be. Uh, uh, for example, for rifaxaban uh, 20, which is the therapeutic dose, uh, if we measure the beak, which is two to four, we, uh, two to four hours from ingestion of the, the, the drug, we, we expect to see uh, a, a, mean, a mean of 215 uh, nanogram, uh, but up to 535 can be seen or had been reported. Now, what is the true value? And again, I leave that for, for uh, Steve, but we don't know the true value actually. And that's what uh, we do. We, we measure both the, the, the peak and trough and see if they are within that limits. Uh, that means likely the patient is within uh, the, the required therapeutic dose. Uh, uh, but if the patient is under or above that level, that means the patient is not uh, a therapeutic either offered or under. And as I mentioned, the, the, there are different tests, different reagents. Each company uh, uh, provide uh, uh, a reagent for different drugs. Uh, now we have uh, at least four um, DUACs approved and uh, uh, at least I know three of them they have um, or four of them, they have uh, a, 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 a reagent to measure their, their uh, uh, anticoagulation effect. Uh, yet, uh, I, sh I should again emphasize that uh, interpretation, the results should be done cautiously, and you need to put both together the clinical presentation as well as the, uh, the, uh, uh, the expected level that you see uh, as, as one of the uh, markers. Uh, um, uh, the, the exact timing of sampling is quite important and important to correlate the laboratory finding with clinical. Finally, we, I need to just highlight that we are in an era of personalized approach. And one of the uh, uh, patients that you may need to personalize their, their anticoagulation are the fragile patients and those who are uh, uh, particularly uh, elderly and uh, with a special situation like renal hepatic failures. Patients with thrombosis and, and hemostasis defects where you have unluckily uh, both the fix present, and that's not unusual, especially in areas where there is a high prevalence of hemostasis defects, like in our area, where you may encounter a patient who has a, a factor five deficiency and a thrombosis. So that needs to be taken uh, in consideration, and the anticoagulation monitoring becomes more uh, needed in that situation. And other special situation has been mentioned, those who, who have uh, uh, lines uh, uh, and needs to be on lines for a long time, uh, uh, they need, uh, and good thrombosis, they need to be monitored more frequently. Uh, the take home message uh, for the anticoagulation quickly that routine monitoring is not recommended for DUAX, NUAX. Uh, measurements can be done with different methodology for coagulation. Say, reasonable agreement is observed between in vitro and in vivo data. The results should be uh, carefully interpreted and plasma concentration. We have to remember that may vary con considerably from time to time. And again, the last message in the anticoagulation, it's quite important to correlate uh, laboratory findings with clinical outcomes to avoid any mistakes. Now, quickly in, in, in like a five minutes, I'll, 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 I'll uh, highlight uh, how we monitor hemophilia therapy and what is needed to monitor hemophilia therapy. As you all know that the field of hemophilia is the same as, as we had seen tremendous uh, uh, evolution in the care of the thrombosis. It's the same. Uh, there is a, a big evolution and a lot of, uh, of new drugs came to the market and the pipelines of the drug, uh, including gene therapy, is quite uh, promising in the field of hemophilia. 
uh, with the presence of these factors, uh, uh, particularly the non-factor replacement, a lot of changes happened in the, in the field of uh, uh, testing. Uh, adding to that, we need to remember that there is a huge cost in the, of treatment of patients with hemophilia. And without going through all these math, you can, you can uh, see that near drug cost yearly 1 million Saudi real uh, uh, for a patient with hemophilia. If, and if the patient will go and receive a, a gene therapy, a $2.3 million uh, uh, is a cost of that therapy. So that's uh, 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 bring the use of methods like pharmacokinetics, use the uh, uh, measurements of the, of the factor, so you avoid excess factor, uh, supplement excess unneeded prophylaxis uh, become more, uh, more needed. For, for measurements of factor level, we all know that we have uh, uh, basically three methods, the preferred method, and it's available but everywhere uh, at the one stage, the two stage, which, which is high uh, precision, but require, with no requirements for factor uh, uh, eight deficient plasma, but it's not available everywhere. And it's the same for, for, for the chromogenic. There are a lot of, of, of uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages in, in, in both methodology uh, with limitations uh, um, uh, that will, will need a, a whole talk to, uh, to talk about it. The, the, the clinical point I would like to highlight here is that when you need to use the, the measurements of for, for factor eight level, you need it definitely for establishment of the diagnosis and uh, classifying the, the patient to mild, moderate, or severe. So you need an accurate method. And that's why the, the, uh, the accuracy in measurements and all the things that uh, uh, Steve talked about it in the pre-analytical phase may affect the measurements and uh, 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 diagnosis of uh, a severe form can happen for a mild or a moderate form of, of hemophilia if there is a problem with sample uh, integrity uh, with brilliant analytical uh, uh, variables. Uh, uh, we, we need to do the level during the prophylaxis. So when we start the prophylaxis, either using the pharmacokinetic or without the pharmacokinetic, you need to uh, uh, measure from time to time the level and, and estimate the level to adjust the dose. And if you have uh, um, um, a signs of inhibitor, you need to go and do uh, inhibitor measurements using either Bethesda, modified Bethesda, or ELISA uh, if you have a problem of, of fixing the, uh, uh, the test uh, locally. Uh, uh, the last part, which is I need again to highlight, is the presence of a new uh, drugs like imicizumab or Hemlipra uh, bypassing a drug that doesn't need the, the coagulation system and bypass to the uh, formation of the clot directly uh, without factor eight or factor nine may result in, in a change in the understanding and a message to everybody when, when you receive a patient known to have hemophilia and you see a level of PTT become normal, expect that the patient may have uh, uh, or may, may start it. And, and luckily in Saudi, we have more than 70 patients now started on emicizumab, and there is a, a big movement to change uh, to uh, hemlibra in, in prophylaxis, particularly children. So uh, these two effects, affecting the APTT and affecting the, the emicizumab, uh, a factor eight level, which normalize the factor eight level and render these two tests useless, which uh, you need to uh, uh, be aware about it and, and uh, know that the ABTT become overreactive and get normalized in presence of emicizumab and the same Is for, uh, yeah. Uh, I almost done. Uh, okay. factor, sorry? Go ahead. Yeah. Fine, you need factor to finish. Eight, uh, one, uh, yeah, in one minute. Uh, uh, factor eight, one stage activity is overactive, so uh, you shouldn't use it. For, for uh, factor eight chromogenic activity for endogenous or exogenous, you may use the bufine, and for uh, emicizumab uh, little, you can use the humanized uh, one. I think by that, uh, I hope I had covered uh, the two uh, difficult areas, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Talib. Very outstanding uh, presentation and 
in, in a topic that's very sensitive to us in the laboratory medicine. Uh, now we'll go back to Dr. Uh, Stephen for the last talk about the diagnostic solution for anticoagulant monitoring. And please, uh, for the, all, the audience, kindly uh, put your question in the Q&A uh, box, the scientific question that you need us to uh, discuss with our uh, speakers at the end of the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Thank you, that's uh, fantastic. I'm hoping that you can now see my slides. Yes, so, so so I already said uh, thank you to the Saudi Society of Blood Disorders for uh, the invitation to participate. Um, I did also want to thank uh, Rush Diagnostics Saudi Arabia, particularly Asil al Yawar, for the facilitating, let's say, the session. So in the last presentation, I was asked to discuss uh, some data uh, from my own lab and some from the literature uh, in I say a new solution in terms of diagnosis and monitoring of coagulation disorders and um, some systems now available from Roche uh, Diagnostics. So if we just remind ourselves when, when, when we're making these decisions in the laboratory in our centers about what, what type of automation, what reagents we require, I think these are some of the important considerations. What Can we get the full range of investigations? What's the throughput in terms of uh, handling our routine workload? Um, do we have the accuracy and the precision that we require? I think it's particularly important that we have automated pre-analytics hemolysis and so on, and already mentioned that in the, the earlier presentation. Um, I, I think that particularly is required if we want to put our coagulation analyzers onto total laboratory automation, onto tracked sample handling, where we've removed the manual handling of samples. That's an advantage in manpower, but I think it requires these automatic checks because when we remove the manual handling, we also remove the opportunities to observe and detect pre-analytical problems like tube filling, like visible hemolysis when we move a sample manually in or out of the centrifuge. So again, I prefer total laboratory automation as long as we've got the automated pre-analytics. So I think that's an important component. Uh, we should consider the, the staff who will operate the analyzer. And, and, and of course, critically, I think it is a compar um, the comparability with other uh, methods that we might be switching away from, let's say. So this is the uh, Cobas uh, T711 analyzer. And th th there are a, a number of models in the range. The T511 is a, a smaller instrument. I'll mention something about this. And the T711, we, we've had both of these in my lab at different times. The T711 uh, is, is still in place with us. Actually, it's probably about five years now. So really from the very beginning, we were involved in some of the um, early evaluation work, let's say, some of which is points, and we'll be talking about that. I think it's essential to have primary tube cap piercing. Uh, of course, there is a, the samples are more stable if we're able to keep them capped, but it's also a health and safety aspect. Okay, we don't an anticipate uh, huge problems with, uh, let's say, transmission of COVID virus in blood samples. Uh, there are some reports that somewhere between one and five percent of samples may contain active virus. The majority probably don't, but nevertheless, of course, there are many other transfusion-linked viruses, and if we've got to take a cap off, there, there's the opportunity to create aerosols. So I think it's important to keep the tubes capped and to have cap piercing. And um, we'll talk about the um, throughput in a moment based on some of our data. I already mentioned the sample integrity, the hemolysis, ictrus, lipemia checks, I think, in my opinion, really important. I think one of the uh, probably unique features in relation to hemostasis analyzers is the reagent management systems that have been incorporated on, onto these. So it's a cartridge-based system, and that's perhaps something more familiar to colleagues in clinical chemistry departments, but I think it's not something that we've seen very much of in, in our hemostasis. But I think it gives us some nice uh, options, let's say, in terms of uh, having a, a, a large number of uh, test capacity on board the analyzer. Uh, and I think in particular, it, 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 the way these operate on the 711511 systems, I particularly like the automatic reconstitution where the analyzer 
does the reconstitution, measures the volume and so on and so forth. Because those of you who are in the call at the moment who are working in laboratories, I expect you will recognize some of these, let's say, sources of error when we in the lab need to manually reconstitute reagents. I'm sure that I personally have made all of the mistakes on this slide at some point, particularly when it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm maybe a little bit tired, put, use the wrong volume. Maybe the pipette calibration is uh, not in place or, or perhaps I've misused it, the wrong diluent, contaminated diluent. And uh, particularly, I think for, for manual reconstitution, there are potential problems with reconstitution time that's not long enough. M maybe somebody forgot to make a reagent up um, or, or even using reagents beyond their reconstituted stability. So, so I think the onboard reconstitution is an important advantage. I suppose the manufacturers will respond and, and maybe bring the same in future. And I think that'll be welcome. I'm going to show you um, a number of uh, slides of data from some of the evaluation work. And these are the sites that have been involved in different collaborative studies over the last four or five years. Um, uh, colleagues in Sheffield have done all the data that I'll be showing, Anna Lowe, Rob Jones, Jess Crean, uh, three of my colleagues in the uh, Sheffield Haemophilia Laboratory. So I think I mentioned earlier the precision, so we, we need to be, of course, sure that we've got suitable reproducibility on our analyzers. And, and this is an, uh, a comment taken, a recommendation, a requirement taken from the CLSI a guideline for PTA, PTT, that reminds us the total coefficient of variation for an analytical system for PTs, APTTs. We, we should take into account of all the uh, variables and the between day and so on and so forth, the variability, we should be obtaining a, a CV of less than 5%. Uh, and so I think it's important to, to check this. There's some data here in terms of, let's say, within run immediate replicates, uh, a number of different lot numbers of reagents four different sites in this particular study. Uh, and you can see that all of these CVs are less than 1.5%, uh, different uh, percentages depending on the level of abnormality. I, I will uh, come back to this uh, point that there are th three different uh, types of APTT reagent available. And, and I think in particular, it's important to have an APTT reagent which has relative insensitivity to the presence of lupus anticoagulant. And, and I say that because I think one of the common causes of isolated, prolonged, unexplained APTT in many of our centers is an unexpected, previously undiagnosed lupus anticoagulant. And that can cause, I think, a number of problems. And, and I think the unexpected findings through a long APTT of lupus anticoagulant, those uh, patients are, are not those who go on to develop uh, thrombosis and recurrent fetal loss and so on. So, so probably it's a chance finding. Those patients are not, in, at least in my centre, are not actively managed. So therefore it causes problems when we detect this because it can cause delays in surgery. Uh, it can cause uh, expensive uh, time, clinical time, patient time, and, and it can cause patient anxiety. Um, so I, I think it's useful to have a reagent which will not be picking up chance of finding these lupus anticoagulants. So again, CVs, um, excellent. Uh, same for thrombin time, D-dime of fibrinogen. Uh, in particular, I wanted to just draw attention to the uh, CV, CVs, I apologize, here for D-dimers. And, and this is a, a method with a uh, cutoff for PTE exclusion of 0 0.5 micrograms per mil. Okay, some reagents will, would work in 500 nanograms per mil in this case. 0 0.5 micrograms per mil. So, so these are samples, uh, let's say, just above the cutoff. So this is an important area for D-dimer testing. And I think one of the problems with many D-dimer methods is that the rather poor precision of results in that area of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, up to 1, 1 1.5 micrograms per mil. And that's not a problem here. Actually, we're seeing really very good um, reproducibility. In, in my experience, this is probably the best CVs we've seen in relation to D-dimer testing. Often we don't need hugely, hugely, fantastically precise methods. But I think D-dimer is an area where it's really useful to have the best possible precision because of the way the number might be used uh, to, to select patients who can be spared from an ultrasound depending on the uh, probability scores. So it's got such a direct impact on patient management. I think it's helpful to have a really precise assay in, in this particular case of D-dimer. 
uh, total reusability, uh, all less than 5%. This is taking all the components within and between day, between analyzers and so on, and between sites. And, and the only uh, figure above 5% is one of these in this APTT method. And, and this figure of six uh, was in a sample in which it was, let's say, gross prolongation. So I think it's perfectly acceptable. And, and in fact, the individual laboratories each had internal CVs less than 2% on that sample. So it's a highly precise system. Um, so, but of course, another important question, what, what about the comparison of results on a new system? It's, a, it's an important change to make in a laboratory to switch analytical platforms and reagents. So I, I think it's important to have information about how a new system would compare to an old one and, and, or a previous one, let's say. So this is a recommendation from CLSI. Uh, one way to make decisions and judge, let's say, relatively new systems is compare them to others in common use and, and that's the approach we took in some of our collaborative studies that I'll mention in the next few slides. Uh, so these were the reagents for comparison in, in these next few slides and these as you can see are uh, Siemens reagents in combination with uh, CS analyzers and of course if we chose a different comparator let's say IL Werthen it's likely that we would see different relationships so, so these were all Siemens and CS analyzers. So PT uh, INR determination. So on, on, on the left, we've got results shown as INRs uh, on the Roche system on the vertical axis and the comparison in this case, Siemens Innovin on Sysmex here. Uh, and so INRs on the left, prothrombin times in seconds on the, on the, on the right. So a really, really good correlation. You can see there's very little scatter of points about the line. So when that occurs, it means that the two systems are both really rather precise. It also means that the reagent characteristics are rather similar because these are samples with, uh, including patients with liver disease, patients with physical antagonists, normal subjects, and so on. So it's, it's really quite a mixture of uh, clinical grouping. So it's, it's really an excellent correlation. I think it's important to have uh, a recombinant tissue factor reagent and this allows us to, I think it's particularly an advantage when we're working with, uh, let's say, over anticoagulated vitamin K antagonist therapy patients, but also when we're working with subjects with bleeding disorders. So this is a comparison of one of the Roche APTT reagents uh, shown here, plotting times in seconds, and, and here the comparator, in this case, acting FS on Sysmex CS5100 analyzers. Actin FS is a reagent which is particularly insensitive to the presence of lupus anticoagulant. It's the one that we use routinely in my own department and, and we selected it exactly because of its lupus insensitivity for the reasons that I mentioned. So we don't see exactly identical results, but once again, there's very low scatter. And there are a number of patients included in this group who are positive for lupus anticoagulant. So we can see here that there's a, a very similar mm, uh, lupus sensitivity, let's say. Turning to D-dimer, so uh, the, the, the same data are shown on uh, all, all three slides, but on the right is the full range, apologize, the full range right up to, like in this case, 21 micrograms per mil, that would be 21,000 nanograms per mil, so really quite elevated, the kind of levels that we are, I think, seeing much more these days in, in a number of our ITU COVID positive patients, we're certainly seeing that in Sheffield. Very, very gross elevations in D-dimer. So it's a really good correlation, really very little scatter. On the left is a subgroup of all of these data, restricting it to those up to around nine. I think the important area is in the middle. So these are those uh, patient samples in which the D-dimer is below or, or just above the cutoff for venous thromboembolism. So cut off 0 0.5, and, and once again, really good correlation. And I think that's important if we were switching, let's say, between these two methods. And I can tell you that none of the 550 samples that's across uh, four sites, none of the samples were, were below 0 0.4, clearly negative, let's say, by one method, and above 0 0.6 with the other, and clearly positive. Of course, in that area, gray zone between 0.4 and 0.6, because of the precision of the test, then there will be some that sits just below, just above 0.5. But the none that were clearly negative by one method, clearly positive by another, I think that's also an important finding. 
I think it's helpful for laboratories that we see very little variation in results when we switch from lot one lot number of reagent to another. And that was the case here. These are simply the data from our Sheffield lab, but it's very similar in the other labs looking at other lot numbers. Lot one versus lot two, very good uh, correlation, very little scatter. Same for FTT, same for D-dimer. We could use the same reference range as the lot changed without need to adjust it. That's practically useful, I think. I think it's important to have the opportunity, the option to mix different models from the same range. Of course, it depends on the throughput, it depends on the workload, whether we might choose two 711s or a 711 and a 511 or some other combination. But I think when we may consider different models, it's important to know whether or not the results are similar on the two systems. Of course, a good manufacturer will work hard to try to deliver that. I think it has to be checked. And we were able to confirm that for PT on here, APTT in the middle, D-dimer, there's a really, really good agreement between results on the two systems. Interchangeable, so we can run samples on one or the other, and we don't need to uh, worry about which, which the test was performed on. Uh, similar data for the uh, fiber engine assay by Klaus. Oops, I apologize. So method comparison here, very good correlation, very little scatter, similar results. No, no lot to lot variability, similar results on the two systems. I mentioned earlier throughput. And of course, there are different ways to look at the throughput. And, and I think it's tricky for manufacturers to do this in their, in their uh, manufacturing facilities. And, and so what they often do is run a series of PTs. And on another day, they might check a whole series of APTTs. Another day, a series of D-dimers. But of course, for those of us in, in hospital departments, that's not the way we receive our samples. We, we receive all the time a mixture of PTs, APTTs, D-dimers, clotting screens, INRs, and so on. So when we came to look at throughput, we wanted to mimic real life. And so I think that's what we did. And in the three large laboratories that were involved in this particular exercise, my own lab in Sheffield, a lab in Rotterdam, and a lab in Switzerland, we, we processed the samples just as we would have done in our local practice. So in my own lab, batches of 20, 30, 40 samples arrive, they're processed. Meanwhile, another batch, 10, 20, 30, 40 arrives, they start to be processed. So, so we did that same, same here when we came to assess a throughput. Again, the real mix of patients, unselected, the ones that arrived with us. It's about 60% normal, 40% abnormal in my centre in terms of results. And of course, that also includes some periods where we got a gap between samples arriving. So that again reflected the way we ran the throughput studies on the, the system. And when we did this, the, the, the measured average, let's say over a period of several hours, mimicking the normal practice in our centers, uh, we got something around three to 340 tests per hour. So sometimes that was PT, INR, the only test. Sometimes it was PT and APTT, sometimes PT, APTT, dimer. But we also did some calculations. Suppose there was a constant supply of samples, not, not the case in our normal practice, but if that had been the case, perhaps with more centralization, then we calculated the throughput maximum would have been somewhere around 400 test results per hour. Three labs did the study in relation to um, 711, and the 511 was assessed just in a single center. Uh, the measured throughput was around 125 here. And when we did the same kind of calculations, it, the throughput maximum was about half on the 511, what we would see on the 711. So I think that's information to consider if you were looking at a mix between the two systems. It, it was the case that that throughput was affected when HIL checks were included. Personally, I strongly recommend including the HIL checks for all the reasons we've discussed earlier in relation to um, pre-analytics in more detail. It was about a 10, maybe up to 20% impact on the throughput. I think that's nevertheless important to have that active, again, for all the reasons we've mentioned. And, and, and these are some published data from a different center that looked at the detection of hemolysis and, and ictus and lipemia, on, on, in this case, the COBAS 511. You can see the publication details here. Uh, these were the levels of uh, hemoglobin artificial hemolysis, let's say, that were, let's say in the settings. Um, and what this uh, study did was rather like the data I showed in the first presentation, 
compared results on a pair of samples from the same patient, a hemolyzed sample that should not be accepted, and a clear replacement, no hemolysis in the replacement, confirming that the first sample was an artifact. Compare those results. And they were able to show that prothrombin time and antithrombin essentially unaffected, and, and, and that, that's consistent with the data I discussed earlier. However, they did report some clinically significant effects of hemolysis on this uh, on the Roche system in relation to APTT and actually also in D-dimer. Effects on APTT were a little bit variable, mainly shorter in hemolyzed samples. You can see the mean results here. It doesn't look a huge difference, but nevertheless, in some individual patients, it really was enough to change the patient management. So, uh, so these authors concluded that those samples should should not be tested, and, and I agree with that conclusion. D-dimer was consistently, if, if it was adjusted or changed, let's say, by hemolysis, the impact was always to see a falsely elevated, a higher result. You can see the averages here. But since it's always a false elevation, that at least gives the opportunity to draw some conclusions from the results, if for any reasons it, it's not possible to replace a hemolyzed sample. You know that the result is not, not, not higher than the one that you've observed. So if, for instance, the test were being done to exclude venous thromboembolism, a result below the cutoff, 0.4, 0.5, or in this case, 400, 450 below the cutoff, even if there was some false elevation by hemolysis, still you would have answered the question, it's below the cutoff, patient who under, depending, of course, on the clinical probability might not need an ultrasound. So I think these are the kind of things to keep in mind. So last two or three slides. I think um, some key points in relation to the analyzers. It's possible to use cat piercing on, on different tubes. I didn't show the data. Um, I think that's important, particularly for larger centers who might be receiving primary tubes from outlying sites. Uh, in my opinion, it's really important to have automated pre analytics, again, the reasons we've discussed. I think the cartridge reagent delivery on, on board reconstitution is a real uh, positive, it's a real advantage. It's, the moment I think is probably unique on coagulation analyzers. I think that does remove some important sources of laboratory error, let's say. And I think I've shown you the data. I hope to convince you that the results are interchangeable between platforms and reagent lot numbers. That, that's practically useful for, for, for those of us in the lab who want to keep control of the variables. I think there's excellent precision. Probably most tests more precise than is really required for clinical management purposes. Sometimes in the lab, we're guilty of trying to produce the best possible precision that's maybe not needed. Actually, I think the place it is needed, again, as discussed, is, is in relation to D-dimer. And, and this, in the end, at least in my experience, is the most precise D-dimer method we've worked with. And I think it is needed there. So I think that's a proper advantage. Um, and again, I've shown, I think I've shown that there's a, an excellent correlation with, with one particular widely used system, the Siemens reagents on Sysmex analyzers. Of course, if we make that comparison against a different uh, combination of reagent instrument, uh, worth an IL, for example, we might probably anticipate by a little bit more scatter of points. Um, in, in the end, it's unusual to see such a good correlation in relation to APTTs in particular. It means the reagents have got similar characteristics. So in my opinion, um, the published information suggests that the these particular reagent instrument combinations are all suitable for, let's say, routine uh, service department use. Uh, Anna Lowe, Rob Jones, Jess Creer, the lab scientists in my centre, who did all the work, and then some colleagues at the bottom uh, in Roche who've supported the studies. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve, for this excellent talk, as expected. Uh, I think we are behind the schedule. Um, I have here a bunch of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so I'll start to, with you, Dr. Steve. There is many question about uh, uh, delivery of samples for coagulation to, to the lab, since that most of the hospital now are uh, using the illuminated tube. And you mentioned that shaking of the sample will cause a hemolysis and hemolysis will affect the uh, results. So what's uh, the recommendation nowadays? So I think it's important to check, to, to check the conditions in the local center. Certainly pneumatic tube systems can be used. They're acceptable for PTs, they're acceptable for INRs, 
and, and they're acceptable, particularly and sometimes only if we take the trouble to make sure that the pods carrying the samples don't have too much airspace. If it's mm -hmm. filled with a simple uh, towel, uh, paper towels or, or bubble wrap is what we recommend in my hospital, it stops the sample from moving around and, and that mm -hmm. prevents the hemolysis that can otherwise occur. I think the few tests that should never ever be sent through a pneumatic tube system, one would be anything for platelet function testing. PFA or um, platelet aggregation, he noticed that this can cause activation of platelets. Uh, it can cause uh, loss of platelet function. So uh, there are some data that suggests uh, certain pneumatic tube systems can be used for such samples. But a, in general, it, it's usually the case that, that's, that they're not suitable. So I would not want to send those. APTTs for patients on unfractionated heparin are particularly susceptible to changes in the sample. And so we avoid that also in my center. Other than that, we continue to use a pneumatic tube system. And we notice that with that little bit of packing, it depends on the distance, of course, and the speed of movement. But, but for most systems, fine to use. Just make sure the samples are packed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And another question regarding the time of uh, uh, sampling to testing for PT and BTT in your center? So, so I think if it's a PT only, let's say a PTINR, I think there's lots of good data to show that this is really quite stable. Um, mm -hmm. So 24 hours between collection and processing in the lab, don't see a clinically relevant change in PT or INR. Some studies have gone even to show 48 hours, probably depends on the method. We notice that there can be some individual changes that are big enough to matter. In, in the interval between 24 and 48. So we restrict to 24 hours for PTI and R. APTT, we, we restrict to six hours, unless it's for unfractionated heparin, and then we restrict that to four hours. Mm -hmm. For factor eight, we noticed that on four hours, no change. Five, six hours, we started to see a small amount of change. So I, I prefer to stick to four hours for factor eight. Many of the other factor assays, antithrombin, factor 9, factor 11, factor 7, very, very stable. Like we're really not seeing changes that matter even at, even at 8, 12 hours. Protein S, 8 hours. Beyond that, we start to see changes. So, so there are some test-specific recommendations coming out uh, first quarter next year in an ICSH document. It's not quite out yet, but, but will be out next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, of course. Yes, Dr. Tyler. Uh, I agree totally with, with you, Steph. Um, um, mostly BT, BGT would be fine. The thing that we noticed quite frequently and that's affect uh, the, the diagnosis and management is the onuliparin factor. Uh, uh, quite a uh, 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 good number of cases being, being overcalled as a onuliparin factor. Uh, because of the delay in the testing. And when we repeat the test within the, the four hours, a good number of them, they came to be normal. So the, 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 it, it seems to be the time is quite dependent for factor, for von Willebrand factor. Yeah, I think that, that's an important reminder. I didn't mention that, I, know I do agree. I think it's, it is a factor that can change. We notice particularly, particularly if there's any lower temperatures, the, the fridge, for example, is a special problem. But, but yeah, I think um, no, it's an important point. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Tarak, a question for you from one of the audience that what is the best time to monitor level of direct oral anticoagulant, the peak and the level? Is there um, a solid recommendation for this? That, that's the, the uh, consensus, if I can say, an expert recommendation that uh, you don't need to monitor the uh, uh, DUAX, except mm -hmm. for those special situation where I had mentioned being, being highlighted by Trabudi and the British guidelines uh, when you need. And if you need to monitor, I think you need to do both, the peak and trough, uh, because the peak will tell you the reaction of the patient to the dose, and the trough tells you the accumulation. And the trough is, is, is taken just before the next dose, uh, and the peak is two to four hours from the, from the ingested. And, and be careful, because Sometimes you may get a patient who told you, I took the dose so and so time. And then when you come and measure the, the, the trap and beak, you will find different results. And before making any action, please repeat 
the, the test and, and ensure that the patient is telling you accurate timing of the collection because that dramatically affects the, the, uh, the decision of changing, either decreasing or increasing, upgrading the, the, uh, the measurements. Yes, and there is also another question, but I, I think you already answered the question in your talk about the anti a for fondoblonox and uh, unfractionate, that it's totally different from each other. Emphasize a lot on this because this is one of the common mistakes, especially by our colleagues who don't understand or they don't have complete uh, knowledge about the, the difference in the, uh, the type of anti -TNA. And they think that anti -TNA is anti -TNA. But for, for anti, anticoagulants measurements, anti -TNA is different from anti -TNA. In our hospital, what we made, we changed the test name. So we called it DUAX uh, uh, anti -TNA for for abixaban, DUAX anti -TNA for rifaruxaban, and so on. But for those who they have anti -TNA, please be sure that when you request it, add a comment that the patient is on so-and-so of the drugs. Yes. We do exactly the same, Tarek. I, I like it. Once again, we are in agreement. <laughs> Always. <laughs> right. Uh, another question about the uh, confusion between uh, taking arterial and venous blood for um, anticoagulant and coagulation uh, uh, testing. Steve? But, yeah, so, so it is possible to use arterial blood. I think we have to be a little bit careful uh, with, let's say, indwelling catheters. And, and it's really important. Um, certainly, you can get suitable samples, for instance, through, through butterfly needles in veins, as long as there is sufficient blood discarded, the volume of the tube, uh, so the, the, the pipe, let's say, that, that, that must be discarded before collection. In arterial blood, then, then it does depend a little bit on what tests. If it's the only option and we're looking at, uh, let's say, the screening tests like PTA, PTT, actually they're quite robust. And again, as long as we've discarded sufficient blood, we're probably okay. I, I think we don't want to do some of the specialist tests on such a sample. We, we, we can certainly see changes in, you know, some of the activation markers and things that definitely a little bit different in samples collected in that way. Again, I emphasize here, as, as, as Steve mentioned, uh, for patients who are in ICU in critical care where they have the arterial which being flushed with, or they have a continuous uh, heparin, mm. that needs to be taken in consideration yes. because that can affect the results and affect the decision for changing. Dr. Tarak, a question for you about recommendation guideline for hemophilia patient who is on M60 map in regarding the lab monitoring, that's to say factor 8 assay and or inhibitor assay. Thank you, Nahla. I, I think uh, we are working now uh, to establish local guidelines. There is no uh, clear guidelines and maybe uh, uh, Steve can correct me to uh, monitor the MSC map. Now, there is no need in most of the situation to monitor the level of emesizumab, but there is a need to, to measure the factor eight level for those patients who, who are on, on emesizumab or hemlipra, if they need it in the breakthrough, they needed to receive additional doses of, of uh, uh, factor eight, be it extended or standard half-life uh, factor eight, uh, uh, but there is no clear guidelines. But if you need to, to measure the factor eight activity in a patient with uh, or on emesizumab, you need to use the bufine type of chromogenic assay uh, uh, rather than the one stage. There are uh, uh, things uh, uh, about the modified one stage uh, and maybe Steve can talk about it. He, he had some work on the modified one, uh, but for us, the easiest way is to go with the chromogenic and, and uh, in our uh, local guidelines, uh, we are working on some guidelines to, to uh, uh, guide people when and how to monitor the uh, patients when on emesizumab. Steve. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good advice, Tarek. Um, there are some countries in which there are specific emesizumab calibrators licensed and available. We're fortunate to have them in the UK. But having said that, we're not doing very much monitoring routinely for the reasons you've said. It, it doesn't, doesn't really uh, help very much unless there was a, a real concern about maybe the clinical uh, 
situation had changed and a, and a worry that perhaps the patient had developed an antibody to emisuzumab, incredibly rare, but, but, but not zero. So, so I agree that we're, we're not really a need to do very much in the way of monitoring that. Um, we're doing what, also what you said, which is if we, we've had a couple of patients who needed a minor surgery, uh, but, but sufficiently major, let's say, to be given some factor eight in addition to the emisuzumab. And since it's 30 days or so as a half-life, of course, it, it's still in there. Um, and so we, we did exactly what you said, Terry. We, we made a chromogenic assay with where the bovine, where the 9A and 10 are, are bovine, uh, Coamatic or Siemens or uh, another one from IL. There's a number of options. Um, and, and then the emisuzumab being so specific for human proteins just, just doesn't bind the bovine ones. And we get can measure the, the real factor eight despite all that emisuzumab present. So we've not done it very often, not needed to, but we, we did what you said when we had to. I see. Uh, Dr. Steve, a question for you. Uh, are you favoring using age-adjusted D-dimer cutoff value for those patients mm, more than 50 a, years old to improve diagnostic efficacy of DVT? It's a great question. It's a tricky one. It really is. <laughs> it's a tricky one. So, so in my own center, we are not using an age-adjusted D-dimer. It's about 20-30% of UK centers are using it. We're not doing, and, and the reason we're not, it, it's, it's my clinical colleagues, and I understand exactly their thinking, that they, they, they're concerned a, about the possibility, and I think it's a real but very, very small possibility of, let's say, a false negative, and they really don't want to have false negatives. And, and the, the assay that we're using um, routinely, let's say, was a big study that defended and confirmed the cutoff, but they didn't recommend age-specific thresholds. And when I asked the company why that was, they just had one case amongst the 400 or so confirmed DVTs that would have been missed with an age-specific cutoff. Okay, it, it, is, that, is that sufficient? Uh, so I think it's a, it's a debate. Um, I'd be very interested to see what you, what, what you think, Terry. So we're not doing, but I absolutely understand the people that do. Sensible, very sensible thinking. You can't unify it, but in, in a special situation where you have a patient who is uh, um, on, on therapy and, and you never got uh, a negative D-dimers, then those patients, you may need to do adjust it and then use it specific for that patient, but not universal because that would put you in a risk of false negative and you don't want to go to that one. Last question that we will close our panel with it. Uh, I received a number of questions about libemic samples and how can we deal with it in uh, coagulation testing. So what's your input, Dr. Tarag and Dr. Steve? If well, lipemic, so, so it's possible to do some high-speed centrifugation, um, something like 10 or 11,000 G as opposed to the normal 1500, 2000 G. If you spin for 10 or 11,000 G uh, for six or eight or 10 minutes from memory, you spin the lipid down to, to the point that it, it's, it's gone or reduced enough to, to lose the interference. Actually, it's not something we do in my lab. And the reason we don't do it is we notice that the analyzers these days are so uh, tolerant of lipid that it's a pretty rare event to see a sample that's so lipemic that the analyzer is unable to give us a result. So what we're doing in my center for those uh, handful of cases uh, every, gosh, we probably get what, one a week uh, from 500 samples a day, but not more than that, maybe not even quite that much. We, we, we take the sample to a, a manual technique where we can visually look for the clot. Again, it's a pretty rare event. If I think, I think if I were not uh, let's say comfortable with that as an approach, then I would go for this high speed centrifugation um, and, and that, that would normally allow grossly lipemic samples then to be analyzed. I, I agree totally. I think uh, um, most of the uh, uh, new instruments, they, they react well to the lipemic. There are very, very few situations, particularly for those with hypercholesterolemia uh, inherited where we have a bunch of them nothing can and can do them except when you freeze them remove the then we do the testing and that's what we do in in, in some situation when we we need to do a, a, a coagulation test for highly lipemic patients uh, 
we wait till they get their paresis done, then the cholesterol level goes down, then we take a sample for coagulation. Good idea. I think with this question, uh, we are approaching the end of the, this interesting webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarek. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve. And I would like to apologize from those people uh, putting their question in the Q&A. It's either they are repeating it or uh, not related to our uh, topic of talk today. So I would like to thank uh, our exceptional speakers, and I would like to thank the Saudi Society of Blood Disorder for organizing this interesting uh, activity with the Dr. Firas al Freyh and his team. Thank you very much and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you, Nahla. Good night. Good night, Steve. Be Thank safe. You. Thank you, sir. And Bye. to everyone. Thank you. Good night.